The design and development of the 2012 cars began way back in 2011. So when they finally hit the track for winter testing in February, it was the opportunity to put all the theory into practice. Jerez and Barcelona provided the venues. Only time would tell who had got it right. One of the biggest changes in terms of how the new cars looked was at the front end. For safety reasons, the height of the nose section was lowered, and this created a new stepped effect for many, but not all, of the teams. McLaren's low chassis concept of recent years meant that they were able to evolve their design to meet the regulations. Exhaust-blown diffusers were now outlawed, but that wouldn't stop teams developing new ways to claw back the downforce they'd lost. With a raft of new developments, everyone was keen to keep their ideas under wraps. But as always, there were plenty of ways to keep an eye on what the opposition was up to. Renault became Lotus and showcased a new lineup. The 2007 world champion returned, while Romain Grosjean got a second chance to make a good impression. In a radical move, Toro Rosso scrapped their 2011 drivers and replaced them with Daniel Ricciardo and Jean-Éric Verne. Nico Hülkenberg stepped up at Force India, while Vitaly Petrov moved to Caterham. Bruno Senna joined Williams, and rookie Charles Peak debuted at Marussia. HRT arrived in Jerez with their 2011 car, and the experienced Spaniard, Pedro de la Rosa, at the wheel. The team felt positive after a management shake-up, and just days before the first test, they confirmed Narain Kartikeyan. Mercedes held off debuting their new car and used their time in Jerez to evaluate the 2012 Pirelli tyres instead. Three seasons had passed since Ferrari won their last title, so the pressure was on to deliver. The F2012 was a radical departure from its predecessor, so in Jerez, the team focused on gathering data in a bid to fully get to grips with its handling. They were the defending champions, but Red Bull weren't immune to the odd technical glitch themselves. Electrical problems on the final day in Jerez cost Vettel the morning session. The team still came away feeling optimistic. All eyes were on McLaren to see whether their different aerodynamic approach and the continuation of their double champion lineup would propel them back to the front of the field. With Kimi Raikkonen back in the car and ready to race, Lotus was keen to put the disappointments of the 2011 season behind them altogether. But on the first day in Catalonia, they encountered a fundamental problem with their chassis and had to abandon the second test altogether. With only 12 days of pre-season testing, track time was crucial. Mercedes unveiled their latest challenger in Barcelona and hoped that the F1 W03 could power them to victory. Schumacher's last win was China 2006. While Rosberg was keen to take to the top step for the very first time. The team had the talent and technical prowess. Now the car had to do the talking. Force India's Nico Hülkenberg topped the timing pages on day two.
But the nature of winter testing is that you can be quickest one day and stuck in the gravel the next. Red flags are common as teams push their cars to the limit and beyond. Trying to find that maximum inevitably means a trip or two on the back of a tow truck. Williams had to come back fighting from the word go. 2011 was a year to forget, but with the renewal of their championship winning partnership with Renault Engines, the outlook was positive. Last year's Sauber was easy on the tyres, which meant they could capitalise on long-run strategies. Now they needed to focus on improving their qualifying pace to score some serious points. A modified chassis saw Lotus come back with a vengeance at the final pre-season test. With Grosjean setting the pace, it seemed their earlier niggles hadn't hampered their progress. We lost, uh, I mean, four days all together, but it was just a... Unfortunate thing, but it's fixed and it didn't affect the handling of the car or anything at all. So the car is exactly the same. It's just uh, strong enough now, so uh, just uh, four days lost. And with Kimi fastest on the final day, the E20 certainly looked like a competitive car. But would it be a race winner? The new Marussia should have made its debut with the second Barcelona test, but after failing the final FIA crash test, the team was forced to concentrate their efforts on passing it the following week. Every world champion since 2000 lined up on the grid for the 2012 season. Early suggestions were that McLaren had a car with which both their drivers could take the fight to Red Bull. Ferrari was the big unknown heading to Melbourne. Virtually every area of the car had been fundamentally redesigned for this year, from a new exhaust layout to a pull rod suspension system. But at the final test, the team returned to a more conventional exhaust setup and conceded that a podium would most likely be out of reach at the season opener. Red Bull continued their intensive development program and unveiled what amounted to a B spec chassis. The car that they had unwrapped a month earlier in Jerez was in fact only a draft version of the machine they intended to race from round one. Obviously the launch spec you freeze at a certain point to make sure you know that you're, you, you hit your deadlines to be at that first test and then evolution continues from there, design continues from there and uh, you know we've, we've effectively bought uh, our, our first race package here as I'm sure other teams up and down the pit lane have and then there'll be evolution at, at you know races from to Malaysia to China to Bahrain onwards so uh, it's a never never ending development race and now you know we're really uh, really into the thick of it. So it was all eyes on Australia. Who would have the car to win races? And who would fight for championship glory? Lotus F1 began its days as Tolman before it evolved into the team it is today. Lotus F1 team is composed with a, a lot of racing people, I mean with a true racing spirit. It's uh, 30 years, it's a four-time world champion over two big brands, Benetton and Renault. So you cannot be a four-time world champion in the past you know, and lose everything on the ground. So the goal of the team had to stay, you know. What was the first target? The key target was obviously to build a roadmap, you know, at least over the next five years, 
And obviously, we had to understand and to put in place the right structure. Two familiar drivers return to the paddock. So how was the 2012 lineup selected? On the Kimi side, we had obviously some discussion the year before, and uh, there was some, obviously, concern. Is he capable to be back, or will he be back, and in which state of mind, let's say? Many questioned Kimi's motivation when he left the sport in 2009. What can you do if, if the team tells you that your car is broken because they have an issue with it, uh, that you cannot race, even I asked that I want to race? Uh, people try to make a lot of uh, bull or nothing. I mean, it's an absolutely normal thing to eat the ice cream. It was easy for me to see as a personality of Kimi. He can enjoy, he can fight for the win because he's only interesting in the win and, and it's true, I think, I was not there obviously in this time, but the Kimi we have now is uh, at the same level as he was before when he was world champion and uh, he's quite impressive. He seemed happy in this new, relaxed environment and chose to let the results do the talking. I'm happy what I'm, I'm doing here. Uh, I can do what I want and uh, I will still try to achieve the best maximum result and uh, that's what we are aiming for. We can still have a good time and, uh, and still do the work uh, as professionally as we can. So. It wasn't just Kimi who was producing the results. Grosjean was not to be outdone and made several podium appearances. The car is very good this year. The team reacted very well from last year. Performance is, is there. Uh, we had some very good races. Everybody's trying to deliver the best he can in every area. And, uh, and this is uh, what makes us performing uh, pretty well. With Raikkonen, a proven champion, was the team looking to him for that elusive victory? I don't know, you have to ask from them, so they will probably tell you. I mean, we want to win, that's why we are here. Uh, so until we win, you are not never 100% never satisfied and um, it's not easy to win. And if it would be, we would be winning all the time. 2012 wasn't the first time that Roman had been partnered with a world champion. I think yeah, you always learn from a world champion and the two times I've been in Formula 1 is it's two times alongside a world champion. So uh, yeah, we had some very good results. We had uh, three podiums, which is nice, fighting for the wins a few times. So uh, yes, it's uh, the it's first good season, some mistakes as well, but uh, it's a rookie season. Roman had found himself in front of the stewards after several first lap incidents, but the team still stood by him. He can deliver good speed, he, he out-qualified his uh, experienced teammate many times. He can uh, deliver performance because he scored three podiums in his uh, rookie year. He was even in a position to nearly win a race in uh, Spain. So I think uh, he showed enough for, for him to know that we uh, obviously um, wants to keep him and uh, gamble on the future. Uh, that feels very good to have the support of your team. You know, you're living some very strong moment together from uh, some difficult moment as well. And I think we are, we are winning together or, or sometimes losing together. But uh, I really like the atmosphere in the team and I feel, uh, I feel very like home. That support network wasn't necessary for Kimi. I don't need any people around me. I mean, I, I can do more things myself. Of course, you have to have engineers and, uh, and certain people who does the, does the things that uh, you cannot do yourself because you're driving. But, I mean, I always, always try to do my best, uh, whatever people say. So um, we do the same work, uh, try to achieve the same results than any other, other top team. And, uh, it's very, very similar than it was before. may have had a two-year break, but he hadn't lost any of his speed. Kimi rewarded the team's faith in him and stormed to a well-deserved win in Abu Dhabi. So what will the future bring? Uh, Long-term aim is uh, to establish Lotus F1 team as a, as a top team and uh, with a real meaning, a uh, top team capable of fighting for the World Championship every year.
Senna wins at Monaco. The name Senna is synonymous with Monaco. Ayrton scored five pole positions and six wins in his career. People always ask me if there is a, um, if I think about Ayrton at any at any point. And um, Monaco is the only place where I actually remembered and thought about Ayrton because um, I remember of him on, the, on that podium. That podium is so special, so different from the others. And uh, I was really, really, uh, really happy that I could be in the same podium as he was. Such a special podium like that. It's always interesting to see uh, Ayrton's races in Monaco. Some races he was dominant, and uh, some races he was in a car that was not quite as quick as the other cars. So um, he had to always go above the, his limit and the limit of the car to put the car in the position where it shouldn't be, and then control the race from there. Had uh, the race in 1992 where he got a bit lucky with uh, Nigel's uh, puncture, or suspected puncture and um, into the last corner Nigel was trying to come in wide to come out tight and try to pass on the inside but uh, Ayrton just uh, had to, his, his car was a bit too wide. When he was in front even with the old tires he just uh, held his nerve and uh, the much much quicker car of Nigel and uh, took that win which was obviously very pleasurable for him. So what has Bruno learned from his uncle? You have to take every lesson, no matter if it's good or bad. I remember he was leading the race by a huge margin. He was, I think he had lapped everyone up until P3 or something like that. And uh, his, uh, he lost focus. And then he, of course, found the wall. And it's, uh, I bet it was a great lesson to him because, of course, he he um, had a, an easy race win in his hands. He could just, from that point, he could just chill out and drive slowly and save the car. But he was obviously uh, trying to continue pushing and, uh, and ended up uh, stopping. But I think he got so frustrated that he just went back home straight from the crash, which was just at that, uh, on that road. He um, had a hard time accepting that he made a mistake, considering how much advantage he had. But um, from what he said afterwards, he um, took that as a lesson uh, because he understood what happened there and then he tried to, uh, to grow up and to improve with that. What makes Monaco special for Bruno? You cannot lose focus. You need to be all the time focused, otherwise there's no room for error. It's one of those tracks that uh, has pretty much zero runoff area, so if you make a small mistake, you're in the wall. Um, it has great flow to it, which is very difficult in uh, street circuits. You really get into a rhythm in, in Monaco and you can just push harder and harder and harder and the lap time comes. It's bumpy in a few places, you come from, you have some big braking areas on downhill. So it's, um, it, has, it offers all the challenges apart from real high speed corners. I think during the race, you're not really thinking about the people watching, you're kind of quite focused on uh, not uh, encountering the walls or trying to, to get close enough to the guy ahead of you into the next few corners. But um, the swimming pool area is a, is a place where before the race and after the race you just realize how many people are there, how many boats are there and just the, the ambience there is, is fantastic. And uh, I think it's one of the nicest places to watch because it's one of the places where the cars go really fast. It's a nice change of direction so you can see the cars doing what they're supposed to do. It is from the long cars with the wings they, they have and um, it, gives, it gives us drivers great pleasure as well. It's a very high precision type of uh, corner. The car is always a bit loose there and uh, into the chicane of the scene is um, you have to aim at the a wall on the apex otherwise you don't make the apex corner, the apex of the left-hander. If you, if you turn in, not aiming at the apex, at the wall, you don't make the apex and then you're running wide for the next one. You can easily end up in the barriers there because the curbs are low and the car just takes off on them. We've seen that happening a few times. 
when the Aizen was driving, there were walls on both sides, so you didn't have any room for error. But at the same time, the walls give you, make you uh, give more respect to the corner, and you will uh, not pu quite push as hard. You, you always keep something in reserve. Maybe not Ayrton, because he, he never left anything in reserve, but uh, for sure, um, the challenges were a bit different back then. Almost two hours race. It's very hard, very hard physically, because it's bumpy and it hurts a lot. Your shoulders, your neck, and so on. And if you have also to change gears, it really hurts. <laughs> Ayrton was definitely uh, the king of the streets of Monaco. He, um, he had a little extra that, uh, took, that they took to, to win that many races there. Now it's home to me because I, of, of course, live there. So it's, um, it's a place that, you know, really brings me good memories and uh, every time I think about racing there, it just gives me great chills, great, uh, great uh, motivation to go there and, uh, and have a strong race. It's uh, one, of those, one of my favorite circuits for sure. The restart time is 13 minutes. Might be some rain on the way. Could be some rain on the way. And then it's time to push, time to push. Try to stick with Hamilton. Give it everything these tyres have got now. Box, box, box. Just turn it off. Oh, fantastic. Mark is coming in as well. The last sector is like a lake. We are so proud of you. So big push, big push. Fight, fight, fight. Yeah, come on! He pushed me off the track. I need to keep pushing this thing. Yeah, Idiot. Possible to your head. Made safe with Hamilton. Carry on doing the job you're doing. You will be racing them at the exit. Grazie, grazie, grazie. Fish, 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 nice. Is everything okay? Everything okay? Listen, everything is good. Everything is good. So I'm uh, Jensen's race engineer. So I'm um, a fairly small part of the, uh, the engineering team at, at Woking, really. Um, which means at the track, then my job is to bring together all of the latest information and thinking from uh, Woking, work out how we uh, put all that together and uh, get the best, of, uh, the best job that we can out of the car we've got this weekend. I work as a race engineer for uh, Fernando Alonso. And the race engineer is somehow uh, managing technically the car and is a bit the interface between the car and, and the driver. Well, on uh, during practice sessions, I am like an assistant chief race engineer, so I oversee both cars, um, monitoring what, what the programs of both cars, the way that they're getting on uh, throughout those sessions. And then on a Saturday and Sunday, I just look after Kimi's car um, during qualifying in the race. Dave basically tells me, you know, what gear when I get to the corner. He tells me how much to turn in, how yeah. much to brake. Left a bit, right and then a bit. He's, yeah, left a bit, right a bit. To get on the accelerator. So Dave basically does it all. This is the, um, the radio button here. So when I want to talk, I push it up and then... I push it down when I remember. Uh, I do forget sometimes. We have um, a system on the pit wall, like an intercom system, um, where we can talk to lots of different people. Um, and there's one particular channel for the driver that you, that you, can, you can press and talk to him. The driver's obviously got earpieces in, so he can hear, um, and he's got a microphone in his helmet. And he has a button on the steering wheel, this one here. He presses that, uh, and it latches on, and then he can talk freely. Uh, when he's finished talking, he presses the button again and then it turns off. If you can involve the driver into the decision process, making decision process, then it can become very useful, very fruitful, because he has a view that you don't have. He can view the things from the car, he knows the state of the tires, he knows the state of the track. So if you can get this information, it's very useful. And I think he has this capacity to drive and still have some resources available to analyze the things. Sorry, but I don't understand the strategy. If we go for three, we go longer, and we forget Maldonado. But if we stop two laps later than him... Speaking about the case of Kimi, actually, he is not clearly the most talkative uh, guy in the paddock, but we never felt uh, like we were missing information from him. Some of the 
way he sounds on the radio is just due to his um, him being Finnish, I think, really. Uh, he sounds quite direct, but I think it's... And uh, to you, maybe he sounds angry, but not, a lot of the time he's just trying to get across his point. OK, braking may have been bad because Kurz was full, but now the Kurz is releasing. Braking should go back to normal. We are currently under threat from Michael behind. We need to get past Hulkenberg. So maybe what you hear has been maybe he's a little bit angry or aggressive is actually him just being very try and be clear and concise on the radio. They know what I want to know as the information, and I, I don't need much the information. And uh, I don't. I'm not a big fan of talking a lot in the radio because I try to do my my things and uh, and uh, driving uh, driving. So. Uh, you need to be very clear, very honest any time with the engineer and try to explain the feelings that you have in the car because they have all information in computers, they have the clever people with all the studies, etc. And you just need to, to, to give them the right information. There are several uh, types of information because you go from uh, instructions just to run the car, like to run the engine, uh, settings of the cars, uh, and so on. Then you have uh, information about... Uh, uh, the plan, for example, we go out, there is a run, we... how many laps, what is the objective of this run, and so on. Approaching corner 7, radio for you there. Okay, the radio is very loud and clear for us, I keep just talking to check the coverage. Uh, I see you approaching corner 10 now, Mickey Mouse chicane. You help the driver with the managing the traffic, who is behind, who is in front, what is, where is the best gap to work. And this is um, made easy to us because we have the GPS map with the cars. And then there are uh, information related to managing the qualifying and the race. So you speak about classification, timing, gaps, uh, uh, race strategy. Okay, we are P3 at the moment, Hamilton, Maldonado, us. It's very important, the, the level of trust in, in your engineer, because uh, at the end of the day you rely everything on, on his decisions and uh, um, when you need any information, when you need any help, uh, is the person that is very close to you, uh, outside the car, because you spend all day with engineer talking about the strategy and diff different things, and when you are in the car, is the only person you have contact with. The driver is putting a lot of faith in, and trust in the, not just the engineer, but the entire the car and the whole team. They're obviously bolting together the car that he's then driving around as fast as he can. So th there's a there's a huge element of trust. All I really try to do, no matter what's going on on the pit wall and how frantic things are, just try and make sure that it's always calm and, and everything at least sounds like it's under control. Alonso's pace is fairly strong, but nothing we should be uh, overly concerned about. And his tyres are four laps older. An engineer has never driven a Formula 1 car, so you've got to really have, have a good understanding between each other. So he understands what I'm saying and what I mean by that and what we need to do at the pit stop, for example, or with the switches in the car. Um, and also, there are, there are things like, you know, through a stint, I won't be pushing 100% the whole time. But when it gets close to a pit stop, there, you know, I need to push hard. And, you know, Dave will come on the road and say, come on, you've got to give it all you, you've got just to... You know, to, to, to really get you 100% so that you're ready and you give your best. You know, a few races this year and, and what, the previous two years, you know, Dave said, we can win this, we can really, we can fight for a win here. And that really, that really does help. And I think uh, it's not just good for me, but it's good for the other people that can hear on the radio as well. It's in three and a half laps to go. We can have him, we can win this race, Jeff. Fernando, I think he gets angry when uh, he thinks that the game is unfair. I think he has this strong uh, feeling, and when he thinks that something didn't go, it wasn't fair, then he may get a bit angry. When you are adrenaline uh, maximum, when you are driving and there is something that is not right, obviously uh, you, you want explanations so or you want uh, to, to, to say something. Once somebody's had a bit of time to calm down, normally they can appreciate that. 
and obviously there's a lot of frustration, especially if it's something that puts them out of the race or loses them time in the race, um, then they can be obviously quite upset. Um, but normally after a, a little bit of time, everything calms down again and it's back to normal. Valencia was the most emotional race and, um, and the whole complete race, uh, I think the radio message were, were quite emotional and quite, quite fun to remember now. It was a very special event for me. I felt uh, very privileged, first of all, uh, to be the representative of Ferrari on the podium. And then, because on the podium there were drivers uh, that I worked with, and I'm thankful to Ferrari and I'm thankful for, to these drivers that they wanted to work with me. So it was a special event, and like I said, I felt very privileged. Because sometimes you win the race, you do whatever uh, things you do, and then you, you forget that there are cameras everywhere, or you go in the podium, you jump, or whatever, and then you see the image in the news uh, a few hours later, and uh, you said, well, it's true, there are cameras everywhere, I cannot do anything. Even now behind the podium there are cameras, so you cannot even talk there. So it's, it's, it's uh, difficult and in those moments you completely forget. When I'm racing, when we're racing, it's, uh, yeah, as I said, it's a lot more clinical and there's no laughing and joking on the radio. Um, it's all pretty serious business. Good job, mate. Woo yes! Thank you, boys. Each and every one of you. Thank you. No matter who you are.
1991. Who'd ever have thought a young sports car driver would come into Formula One and absolutely dominate? Seven times world champion. Broke all the world records. Absolutely brilliant driver. And without any doubt, the greatest ambassador our sport has ever seen. For me, there is something special because we have, uh, I had the privilege to work with him uh, many, many years. And uh, I know him uh, since a long time, since the first days in Ferrari. And uh, I know how much he was dedicated to that project. And I know what was the difference that he made to the team. And so I will never forget that. And uh, I'm sure that looking ahead, Michael will be once again champion in life. But uh, knowing him uh, quite well, I would speak it privately, not in front of the camera. It's been one of the greatest privileges of my life to work with one of the greatest racing drivers ever. And uh, I've got so many fond memories of working with Michael and being part of what he's achieved. It uh, will stay with me forever. So uh, um, it's been a very, very special period. It makes a lot of fun to drive, and also for the time, I'm really happy here. We want to win the championship. I mean, that's our ambition. Somebody will win and somebody will lose. When we go for it, we go for it. I really can't describe it. I mean, it's something crazy.